Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Gypsy Poet Radio here on blogtalkradio.com, friends slash Gypsy Poet. I am the Gypsy Poet, and of course with me is the wild and crazy and sparkling girl, George. And this afternoon we got an awesome artist, and I, she knows how much I love artists because they are very close to my heart and because they got a great philosophy of attitude is the mind's paintbrush. It can color any situation. Please welcome the awesomely talented Matt Gleason. Everybody with me? Hey, George. How you doing? We go way back to Al's bar back in about, what, 85, 86 was a starving band. The band oh, well, used well. to play, and you would paint a painting while the band was playing. I've never seen that before. And you oh. played with the Tyson Brothers, and we all played together at Al's bar. And at the Love Inn. We did the Love Inn together, too. Oh, so man, what have you been doing since? I left uh, L.A. in 95. Oh, man. I I was painting, and I decided uh, that uh, there were very, 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 very long odds to make it as a painter relative to my aspirations. And I was always happier with my writing. At, as far as the results I would get, I always enjoyed making mm-hmm. art. But I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed the results I got with writing. And so I ended up uh, writing, and I started an art magazine, and it got pretty successful relative to the um, art world, at least. And uh, mm-hmm. and now my uh, now I have an art gallery where I'm back to uh, – now I have an art gallery, and I've leveraged a lot of the relationships I made over the years uh, in the magazine. The magazine was called Coagula Art Journal, and my gallery is called Coagula Curatorial, and we're in downtown Los Angeles in old Chinatown. Oh, cool. Is it, is it around Al's Bar? Close? Oh, it's about a mile from Al's Bar. I don't know if you know that the neighborhood around Al's Bar is now the most um, high-end, yuppified, mini hipster Beverly Hills there ever was. It's called the Yeah, Arts it was District. getting that way. It was getting very g- gingerfied. Is that what you call it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's beyond gentrified now. The average income in the Arts District is over $90,000 a person. Oh, wow. And we're talking about an area that when George and I were, were denizens of, it was uh, Skid Row, was the, the <laughs> that was the good part of town. <laughs> and people were sleeping in boxes. <laughs> people were sleeping in boxes, and there were, um, uh, you know, there were, there were guys who would say, oh, let me watch your car for a dollar when you'd yeah. park to go to Al's Bar, and if you didn't give them a dollar, they'd break your window and take your stereo. <laughs> so uh, you remember the good old days. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about what what uh, got you into art. I want to know like um, some of your influences. Um, you know, uh, my biggest influence uh, as when I in my very short art career, as far as making visual art, was a French painter, mm-hmm. Georges Mathieu, who um, ah. he was most known for doing paint, performance painting in the late 1950s and um into the 60s and even the 70s um and he is uh kind of you know not not exactly you know, i mean he's not a household name like picasso but he's he's very well known uh historically um and his paintings are in a lot of museums and he made giant abstract paintings but he made them live in front of audiences in various uh, performances and so um i was uh friends with um some musicians who had a band called the Starvin band and i could neither play an instrument nor sing on key but uh, the 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 starving band was a pretty uh open uh, small fraternity i guess you could say of outcasts and so when the starving band would play guitar and sing i had an easel and i would put the easel up and in the tradition of my hero george matthew i sort of uh followed suit and made a painting i think um george matthew's paintings were far more uh, elegant and sophisticated, and my attempts were, of course, limited by the very short sets we would do at Al's Bar No Talent Night. Al's Bar No Talent Night. Fifteen minutes, got about, or, or they threw you off the stage and turned yeah, off all yeah. the electricity. <laughs> if, if you got lucky, you got fifteen minutes. George, George had the longest set of the night because she was the most popular, and it got to the point very ritualistic where we would lead up into George's set. So uh, we'd get about a, we'd get, we, I'd get about a good fifteen to twenty minute painting, and. 
Sometimes people would be so drunk they'd buy them, and a lot of times they'd just uh, line the halls of the Starvin' Band rehearsal space, uh, which was an apartment on Virgil Avenue in Mid-City, uh, L.A. This is, you know, we were, the Starvin' Band was writing protest songs about Ronald Reagan, so that's how long ago this was, you know. And five fucking minutes till I gotta go to work. That was the big hit, that was the, the showstopper for the Starvin' Band, it was a great song, five fucking minutes till I gotta go to work, uh, a great song. <laughs> Oh, awesome! Uh, where are you from originally? Oh, I'm I'm a Los Angeles uh, native. I grew up in suburbia, out in a city called La Mirada, which is you know just a there, there's no distinction in L.A. when you're in one if you're not in if you're not in Los Angeles or the beach, you're just basically in some suburban enclave, uh, and so uh, there's nothing distinctive about La Mirada Street, but that's a different thing. Oh, La Mirada Street LA. is, is a, a street in in uh, it it means the look like a, the fashionable look. There's there's magazines oh. in in there's magazines in Latin America called La Mirada. Well, it was like, it yeah. was right below Los Feliz, but in in the uh, in the uh, in the lower part. <laughs> You're kind of in the seedier part of the La Mirada streets in the seedier part of Los Angeles. La Mirada, the, the city is just it's a it's the it's the place where you want to go raise kids. Uh, uh, I think that's that's about it. That that's about as good as it can like be. Like Altadena and all those things. Yeah, it's it's you know there's just one after the other of these these um, semi perfect suburban communities that you. you oh, sort you of painted work. you painted a frisbee at the Love Inn. Some I guy's showing fr- off the frisbee oh, that you oh, painted. Oh. What happened is. Um, George organized love-ins like they had in the 60s, but these were the 80s, so we were we were extremely out of out of tune or out of step with, which which is always fine with me. We were definitely out of step with the kind of MTV era, so she'd have these love-ins. Well, what happened is I think we we were so stoned we forgot our canvases, and uh, so I ended up uh, with my paint set without anything to paint. So I think I paid somebody had a frisbee. And so the, as the Starvin' Band played at the Levin, I painted a frisbee. I think I painted, I remember painting a bed sheet, too, and somebody had well, it Well, the guy was wall. very proud of it. He kept showing it off for the camera and saying, oh, look at this. I got an original painting on my frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a, the, 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 the abstract painting. See, now I'm an art, you know, I, I became kind of an art critic, uh, kind of well-known as an art critic, uh, and, and, uh, I think pe- people would love. There's plenty of artists in town that I've given a bad review to. Would love to look at my paintings <laughs> to give me a bad review. Let me tell you that. I think you better hide. 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 If you, if, George, if you have any starving band canvases, you can just you can just hide those when people come over. Okay. No <laughs> video. I'm into videos, not canvases. <laughs> That's and I'm putting them all up right now, so anybody goes over to my site, you can see all the starving band stuff I can find. Oh dear. Oh man. <laughs> well, thank. I think. Well, you I guys think, are so cute. I think we're fortunate that the uh, cameraman was as was as loaded as we were. <laughs> well, they were from Heads and Highs. That was Captain Ed from Heads and Highs well, that was filming the thing. I read So they were case. very <laughs> loaded. <laughs> that was the oldest head shop, I think, in existence in, in L.A. anyway. Oh, man. You ever I been to Heads and Highs? I uh, if, I think anybody who has, who remembers, hasn't been there. <laughs> yeah, that... They 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 uh they used to come to the Love Inn every year and George Clayton Johnson that wrote uh, a lot of the Star Trek series and uh, he he used to come every year too. Wow, wow! You didn't well, know that, huh? No, <laughs> we had no, some I, famous writers there. We we were uh, there was an inter- it was an interesting art scene. I think uh, I think it's kind of a testament. And I believe this about most artists is that you kind of if you're a, if you're a true artist is really in their own trip, you know, like yeah, they're doing their thing, and and so then somebody comes by historically and says, oh, you were part of this scene, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, well, we were, I was just doing my own thing. I didn't really notice, <laughs> you know. No, I notice. I'm always part of one scene or the other. I was there in L.A. and then I was in Nashville, and then in, in North Beach, and then the Haight-Ashbury, so I've been in many, 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 many. I, I'm 69 years old now, so <laughs> I've been a lot oh, of boy. scenes. I'm a lot oh, older wow. than you guys. You guys were about the fourth or fifth scene I was in. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, it's, it's a different downtown L.A., I can guarantee you that. And and they even had an Al's Bar reunion about, uh, about a month ago. Which, yeah, I uh, heard about it. How'd I, it go? Uh, 
I, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't make it over there. I saw plenty of pictures on Facebook, and I think the thing that I noticed the most was that um, – the the, the 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 new owners have fixed it up and do like a theater um a small theater i think they do yoga classes there even yeah. um i don't think they they don't serve alcohol i think they have like a juice bar or something but um but you could still see the architecture of al's bar i think it's well pretty, the pictures pretty... i've seen it looked too clean for me i like them pretty fancy. oh way too clean al's bar was you know, <laughs> was was certainly uh was you know may you know graffiti was was if if graffiti wasn't born at al's bar it, it certainly met its adolescence yeah. So what are you doing now? Well, the gallery is going really well. We we we've uh we've managed to really um carve a niche in the uh Los Angeles art scene. Uh we show a lot of um a lot of local Los Angeles artists uh who are whose careers are varying degrees. We've had some very successful people. We've had some I've tried to break a few um new artists. That's always tough. Mm-hmm. Um, we try to get collectors down from the west side. You know, the west side of L.A. is where the money is, and downtown is where the where the art really is and where art's created. So getting getting people from the west side and Beverly Hills uh, and the Hollywood Hills, getting the money to come downtown is um, it's it's a little easier than it used to be. Back in back in our day, I would say it was it was very much an, an almost an outlaw sort of place, and now it's there's there's certainly there's certainly a lot of wealth has moved into downtown, but but getting the art collector set to come to the gallery is it's always a chore. Chinatown has a small art scene uh, with a couple galleries and the old you know the old antique shops. The uh, when the grandkids inherit you know the the antique shop in Chinatown, they don't necessarily want to run the family business, and so um, they're happy to rent it to people. And the the, the spaces are actually really great. Relative to the architecture of what you want for an what you want for an art gallery, and so um, I think that the, uh, the the best thing the best thing about China the Chinatown art scene uh, is uh, they're great spaces and you can park once you can see a couple art galleries and then go have some some average Chinese food you know and uh, there's 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 tons of little Chinese restaurants are still in existence there. Um, but we're we're you know the gallery right now is um we we've, we've got uh we've got a good roster of artists and and there's big art fairs in Miami every year and this is our second year going to the Miami art fairs and uh that that really helps that really helps a growing gallery get known relative to um you know meeting collectors uh, nationally and internationally and exposing our artists and right now the LA art scene is known internationally as 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 a leading leading art scene so uh so, so people are very interested in what's going on in LA. So, I'm, I've certainly. What is Mark doing now? The old owner of the Al's Bar. What's he the doing? The old now? owner of Al's Bar. Last I looked, he uh, he's on Facebook, Mark Kreisel. And yeah. um, uh, last I looked, he, you know, he looks. I, I would say almost exactly the same. Maybe maybe a few extra gray hairs. Um, actually, I saw him in Chinatown once. So he was waiting. He had ordered Chinese food to take home, and he he was his his uh, he was the same Mark Kreisel. Um, uh, I think he just. I think he owns a few uh, a few um, uh, apartment buildings or something. I think he's just. A, I think he's just a landlord now. He doesn't have a. Uh, he doesn't have. A, he never opened another bar after Al's Bar, and uh, I don't think he's doing anything. He used to do the Al's National Theater. I don't think he's doing that. I think he's more. I think he's a little more retired. You know, he's 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 a little up there, and I think uh, up there in years, and I think he's just enjoying his golden years. How's that? <laughs> what that? about the Tyson Brothers? What are they doing? Well, the Tyson That's Brothers the were the starving band. Starving band was the Tyson Brothers, right? Starving band. I met the Starving Band uh, at college in the Midwest, and uh, they all ended up moving out to L.A. to form a band and see what they could do. And uh, we we spent many many uh, many a night, uh, many a blurry night together. The Tyson Brothers are all natives of Milwaukee, and are all now back in the state of Wisconsin. Um, there's uh, there was Tom, Ted, Tim, and Terry. Ted was the only one who stayed. He never moved out to uh, L.A., but he did come out quite a bit. Uh, Terry and Ted live in the house they grew up in, in Milwaukee. Tim is married with two kids, and he lives in the middle of Wisconsin somewhere. Um, and Tom lives in Sheboygan. And there's a whole there's a whole old joke about Sheboygan, um, uh, about somebody wanting to have a baby, and they keep trying to have a baby because they want to have a daughter. Sheboygan. Oh, tell, me, tell me about my daughter. Are they still playing music? Oh, um, I think when they get together, they they play music. 
Uh, how often that is, I, I don't know. If, if they, if they, you know, we used to have a the game they would play was pass the guitar, where you got one. You and George, you were there for these, where they you got you got one song, you pass the guitar, and then pass it on to the next person, and they'd play a song, and it would go round and round and round all night between beers and joints. Uh, those were uh, those were some blurry nights. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> great. Do you have any videos of that? But the start of that, we, uh, oh, we, 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 I, I, the only video I have that I have I have is the one from the Love In, uh, and then I I made a video of five fucking minutes because they sent me the music for it, and I put I put pictures of Alice so Bar with it. Now, the other know, stuff is on YouTube, and I just steal it off. I mean, I it's funny that share it. you know they nowadays with Facebook everybody documents everything, and uh, mm-hmm. we had some wild times, but they're just they're these. Kind of, although we we taped a lot, I know that that um, I know the Tyson brothers uh, have a lot of Starvin' Band taped. Uh, a lot of us uh, just hanging out. Well, there's some of it up there. I found some of it where you guys are in an apartment or something talking. Oh wow! Oh no no no! That's that's yeah that's uh, apartment you know. in eighty eighty nine. The Starvin' Band. Wow. Okay. See, that's the thing, and you would hear these great tapes. Of the band playing, but then in the middle of it, somebody would like knock on the door and walk in. Hey, everybody, how's it going? <laughs> like right in the middle of a beautiful uh-huh. song. <laughs> like, oh no. Yeah, I was there for a Halloween party at the house, and, and, and Terry was running around in a dress. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> uh, I remember one year Tim Tyson came. His costume was me, and he and he painted <laughs> he painted zits on his face and wore wore funky glasses and and uh, I was like wait a minute we found a shirt like mine and I don't know if he uh if my girlfriend uh went off with him that night or not I don't I don't I vague I have vague rem- recollections of all this I think they came in dressed as me once too maybe that's why he had a dress on No nope. <laughs> came in got to come But I didn't never wear dresses I never wore dresses Well you were quite the celebrity in downtown LA uh George the first time I came to Al's bar Oh, I had a fake ID at the time, so this was before 1985 even. Um, I was walking down. We parked our car, and, of course, you know, your kids from the suburbs, it's the scariest thing you've ever seen. It's, you know, you're, you know, and we'd been to punk clubs in Hollywood, but Hollywood was very um, orderly, you know. there were You could pull up to a parking lot and pay two bucks and park, and then you could go to the clubs were very, you know, they were very almost manicured by comparison to downtown L.A., so here you are in this abandoned and old industrial section of town, and you're walking through it on a brick building in giant letters. Somebody spray painted Johnny got herpes. Like, wow, what a what a weird graffiti! So then we walk into Al's bar, and about an hour later, this girl gets up on stage and plays a song, Johnny got herpes. And I'm like, oh, that's where the graffiti came from. So that was my first uh, that was my first introduction. So to the what did whole you think thing. of the sword? Yeah, what is, now what, when did you adopt the sword, George? Oh, I, I had that since the 60s. And you never <laughs> I got... I wore it for 30 years. You never got, you never got um, arrested for carrying no, a weapon? No, no. I, I, they made me take it off. I was on an airplane from San Francisco to, to Nashville, and halfway between, I think somewhere over Texas, they made me take it off. I mean, I actually walked on the plane with it around my waist, and, and then about over Texas, they said, "Oh, you're going to have to check that thing." So I guess uh, Texas. <laughs> I think I think I think uh, I think that says more about Texas than it does about you and your well, story. Well, first time I I came in Al's bar, it was Carlos Guitars that brought me in, and I walked in the door and I had the sword and the cape and the boots and the whole bit. I walked in the door and everyone started applauding, and I go, "That's the place for me." <laughs> I went uh, on stage, and they just loved it. So I wrote all my songs for them, about them. I never wrote about me. I wrote for them. I wrote their stories. I listened to what they were saying. Write about them. Johnny got herpes. You make me feel like a whore and living in the war zone. It was all about them. You, you, oh, whatever you was happening about, every week. I wrote new songs every week. You even wrote a song about Al's bar. Oh, yeah. I do it all the time now. That's the one I do all the time now in, in Berkeley. It's the one about Al's Bar. you got to love it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to know something. What's it, what was it like to uh, to meet Charles Bukowski? Oh, oh, I met Charles Bukowski in 1990. Mm-hmm. I was uh, 
I was a big, uh, I was, you know, kid who loved Bukowski. I mean, my favorite author. Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine, her name was Marianne Swistler, was a writer mm-hmm. who wrote um, for the New Times. Um, gotcha. This is, uh, and she, and one of the things she did is she would interview authors. That was her specialty. She would interview writers mm-hmm. and write about writers. And she was very good. And mm-hmm. she was a journalist. Uh, she lives in the Midwest now. Uh, we're still in touch via via the wonderful Facebook. Mm-hmm. But Marianne got mm-hmm. a. Um, she got a thing saying, "Oh, Charles Bukowski gives one interview a year. Would you like mm-hmm. to, um, you know, we we want to hire you to 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 interview him?" And she said, "Okay." And she knew that I liked Bukowski, and she hadn't read any. And she said, "Can you give me some books?" So I gave her a couple books, and she said, "Hey, look, you you have to come with me. I'm, I'm this guy's kind of intimidates me as a woman. You know, uh, would would you, would it be all right if you came? Would it be all right <laughs> if I came? To, would you to see my famous favorite author? My God, let's hop in the car and go now." And we went mm-hmm. down to San Pedro. Where uh, Bukowski and his wife Linda lived, um, he yeah. was he was seventy at the time. He had just come out with a book called Septuagenarian Stew. Septuagenarian is a person in their seventies, and he, yeah. he came out with Septuagenarian Stew. And um, so we went, and Bukowski was great. He's very nice guy. Um, you know, they they were clear to us that they never really went out. That they they did everything at home. They were real homebodies. And uh, he and his wife were, were really gracious hosts. We drank all the all his beer. He drank Heineken, by the way. <laughs> so we drank all his beer, mm-hmm. and then we drank all his wine. We were there till probably 5 in the morning. And um, mm-hmm. the interview that Marianne um, conducted with him came out mm-hmm. in the newspaper. And then it was it's, – there's, there's a book of Bukowski interviews. I think it's called mm-hmm. um, oh, Sunshine Muse, maybe. Um, mm-hmm. And he uh, – and in it – uh, I'm credited as having assisted with the interview. I mean, who cares about the credit? I mean, I got to meet Bukowski. There's a Polaroid of Bukowski and I all over the Internet that, that we took that night with much, mm-hmm. with Marianne, uh, who looks who looks like the Heineken was really affecting her, and then I tried to look my best. Of course, I was pretty scruffy at the time. I've got a funky goatee. and But Bukowski really <laughs> liked me, and, and uh, we kept in touch. And, and uh, you know, he, he, he died about three and a half years Later, uh, he had um, mm-hmm. leukemia, so that was probably, ah. uh, you know, about the last time he was, I mean, he was spry and very, I mean, you know, he got sick, but he, he really battled his disease, you know, he didn't go gently into the night at all, I mean, he, he right. uh, you know, he tried to lead a healthier lifestyle when he was diagnosed, which some people would think, think oh, no, Bukowski's going to get fucked up right to the end, but he didn't, you know, he, he really, mm-hmm. uh, he worked hard to stay alive, and he, you know, he did what the doctor said, but, I mean, you know, it was a Pretty terrible disease, all, all things considered. Did you know S. A. Griffin, the poet? I've met S. A. Griffin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was on our show a long time ago. Mm-hmm. I love S. A. Did you go to any of his open ended it gigs? No, where was that? Well, he had them all the time. For fact, he's the one that started that whole Al's Bar No Talent Night thing. It started oh. out as poets that were throwing stuff at mm-hmm. each other. And they were very loud and and <laughs> very demonstrative. Yeah. And so, anyway, they end up getting in a fight with Mark, and so they left, and then Mark started taking over it, and then it started being punk bands. But when I first went there, it was the poets. I was well, the loudest one there I when I first started. I remember telling Mark, I'm like, hey, there's a problem with your listing in the L.A. Weekly for Al's Bar where it says Thursday. Yeah, because it says there's no talent night. And he's like, no, you don't get it. It's no talent. <laughs> well, that was uh, a poet's joke. You know? I didn't really get that at first. I felt well, like an idiot when he told me that. Griffin. They were very, very. <laughs> like, they were like punk poets, uh, and they had a thing mm-hmm. called the open ended it that they would have at different clubs. Mm-hmm. After I think that. I just missed that. Yeah. Oh, he was great. Did you know Fish Karma? You introduced me to Fish. Yes, Fish was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, you have a. I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of the, some other things here. Uh, what about John Waters? I want to ask about that. Oh, John Waters! You know, John Waters did me yeah. a really big favor. He was um, John Waters, uh, the the film director, was an early subscriber to Coagula. Of course, I was thrilled like when I got this subscription mm-hmm. in the mail. Yeah. Probably, I mean, maybe it was like issue twelve or thirteen. Maybe this was like mm-hmm. ninety three or ninety four. John Waters wanted yeah. to subscribe to my magazine. I was like, I mean, it was like giddy. So I sent. Obviously, mm-hmm. you know, he got his he got his issues with everybody else, and then. Um, I heard somewhere that he was doing a movie about the art world, which was kind of intriguing. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. um, I happened to be in New York 
and I was crossing a crosswalk, and there was John Waters. I was like, hey, John, I'm Matt from Coagula. Am, uh, is Coagula going to get, are we going to get product placement in your art world film? And he chuckled. I was mm-hmm. saying it, you know, I was joking. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But, but I mean, of course, I was half joking. I would have loved, like, anything I can do to get product placement, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do. But, you know, I don't want to come off as like, a, like, a, like just some idiot huckster. And so John yeah. was like, oh, oh, uh, I'll get you in post-production. And I didn't know what that meant. Well, what he did is in post-production, there's a scene in the movie um, – Pecker, which is about uh, a, a guy who becomes an art world star overnight, and it's kind of a send up of the art world and a lot of fun stuff. But there's a there's a scene in it where after the big opening, they're all at the the big party afterwards, and there's a voice comes in and it says, "Oh, watch out! There's the guy from Coagula. It's a magazine." <laughs> and so um, so that so the night Pecker was released, uh, I was we were out wherever I was, I was out, and when I came home, there was like a, 15 messages on the um on the answering machine and this is you know before email or facebook or anything and so there's all these messages mm-hmm. i'm like oh my god there's 50 messages and it starts off with a couple uh, like a friend calling from the east coast hey matt i was just mm-hmm. at the movies seeing john waters movie and they and they mentioned coagula in it and the next one is somebody from the east coast and then the next one is somebody from the midwest hey matt they're 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 mentioning coagula in this john waters movie and then a bunch of people from la so it was, it was like the time thing like they'd seen the movie at nine o'clock you know, say East Coast time, got home at 10 and called me at 8. Meanwhile, at 8 o'clock, all the people are leaving in L.A. to go see the movie, so by the time they get home and call yeah. me. So for a couple of days there, there were just people calling, Matt, I just you wouldn't believe it. They they, they they mentioned Coagula in the John Waters movie. You know, I, it, it, I didn't walk around with a T-shirt saying, John Waters subscribes to my magazine. But, but sure the, bigger, <laughs> the bigger subscriber, though, that was much – who did me a much more <laughs> solid favor was <laughs> for years I had been – um, mailing copies to a subscriber named David mm-hmm. Jones, and um, hmm. you know I never and the company was called iSolar and it was a New York address to David Jones. So in mm-hmm. 1998, when our book came out, our book was called Most Art Sucks, and it was an anthology of the first five years of Coagula. Um, mm-hmm. There was a review on BarnesandNoble.com that had paid David mm-hmm. Bowie half a million dollars to write a book of the month review as like sort of a big hype for the site. And so he wrote a review of Most Art Sucks and talked about how he had been a longtime subscriber. And I was like, Mm -hmm. like, you were were a subscriber to Coagula? Well, what I found out through the trivia buffs was that when his Mm -hmm. career was first getting started, his name was yes. David Jones, but they said, "Oh, you know this guy from the Monkees, Davy Jones. You, you got to change your name because mm-hmm. Dave, you know, the Mon- Davy mm-hmm. Jones is going to be a star for for a long time. You can't compete with that." Yeah. So David Jones mm-hmm. changed his name to David Bowie, but he didn't change mm-hmm. his name, you know, as far as like writing checks. Mm-hmm. So 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 David Jones subscribed, but it was the whole time I've been sending copies to David Bowie. So and he wrote he wrote a rave review of the book and he quoted articles I had written and talked about how great I was and I mean let me tell you that's a lifetime highlight you know beyond anything for David Bowie to rave about you so that that yeah. you know things like that give you more confidence I mean you know you all want to you've interviewed all... Cheech too haven't you of Cheech and Chong oh you know what Cheech is a big art collector and he's bought art from my yeah. gallery cool. and um, <laughs> so what I did is I knew that he was a big baseball fan. And I know everybody wants to like they want to talk they want to talk about smoking pot or they want to talk about you know art because he has such a you know he's so well known in the art world or they want to like try comedy out with him. Mm-hmm. But I'm a big mm-hmm. baseball fan and Cheech is a big baseball fan, so I actually took advantage of meeting him to say, can we do a video talking about baseball? And I posted mm-hmm. it on a baseball website and it's and it's Cheech and I talking about uh, him growing up in L.A. before the Dodgers came to town wow. and there was a team called the LA Angels and so we we talked about the old LA Angels and kind of their relationship to the current baseball team the Angels so um and and so we had a really I mean he is such you know he won celebrity jeopardy so no matter what what mm-hmm. they say about I mean, if that isn't a testament to smoking pot and still retaining your your <laughs> intellect, I mean, I mean, Cheech, Cheech yeah. is a. I mean, you could mention any subject, and you know, we talked about like alien astronauts, and and you know, from from you know, from from the who who brought 
you know, civilization to the world mm-hmm. from other galaxies. I mean, this guy's like, he's really, he's firing on all cylinders intellectually, and he's got an amazing art collection. I got to tell you, I mean, he's bought art from me, but, but you know, regardless, this is not self-promotion. His, he is a great, he's got a great eye. He's good at, at picking new talent, and uh, some of the paintings he owns are just, uh, just you know, invaluable. Have you met Chong? Oh, wow. I've Have not met, met Chong, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's still on my to-do list. Mm-hmm. Yes. I just want to give you a heads up that we are actually out of time. Oh, hey, well, I, God, that went yes. fast. Yes, it did. Thirty minutes on GPR goes very fast. I want to give you. I want to let you know that I have. I've had a blast listening to your stories. You have a lot to say, and the fact that you talked about art just really made my day. So I'm very, very grateful for that, Girl George. You are great and wonderful. Thank you so very much. Um, and guys, please check out Matt Gleason on Facebook and Google him. Find him. He's got some great stuff out there. And check out the galleries and everything that he's got going on. And don't forget to look up Coagula magazine what an awesome awesome experience okay guys this is the gypsy poet with girl george signing off saying adios for now thanks for the trip down memory lane